Now we enter part two of the stream. Uh, we've we've made a character. We've told a backstory to him. We've generated uh, uh, some good content. <clears throat> and uh, oh, by the way, niece is on my on my leg here, so I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything weird. Just being a cat person. And so now I wanted to get into, uh, you know, we're we're telling a focus story or kind of like a um, an orbital story where you have a, a central star of the story and everything we create revolves around him or her. In order to help any of you who might have uh, writer's block or any of you who want to be a DM but don't feel confident in your storytelling skills, I wanted to have a session, <clears throat> and, and we'll do it again later, and maybe in different ways or discuss things, where we, dis uh, we discuss and put our brains together in how to tell a, a, bas a basic, solid story. <clears throat> Pardon. There's a couple different ways. A very good, time-honored, uh, thematic, so it's universal way of telling a story is to go over the hero's journey. The, or uh, it's it's like the, the hero's cycle, you'll see it. And it can be presented in a couple different ways. Uh, this graphic up here is showing one of the more... Uh, one of the more popular... Well, geez, now I just gave you a bunch of gray area. It didn't quite do what I had expected. <clears throat> I could zoom in here. Well, hopefully you all can, can see it well here. We have Act 1, where the story opens up in an ordinary world. Something happens in the ordinary world. That's the call to adventure. This is, uh, you know, you're a wizard, Ari. Or this is receiving a... Um, a mystical letter, or you find a bottle washed up on shore, or, uh, you know, look at uh, Zelda, Link to the Past, where uh, your uncle was going out in order to, you know, bring justice to the land, but he ends up falling, and so you, concerned, go after him and take up his uh, sword and shield. <clears throat> so we have a call to adventure. Something happened. The evil king raised the village next door, and so this village is preparing. And they need uh, every able-bodied uh, man and woman in order to help defend against uh, this, this Mad King's rule. Then you have a refusal. And that is... Uh, by the way, if any of this is starting to sound familiar to books or anime or whatever, uh, there's a reason for it. Refusal. That's... Your main character says, well, look, I'm... I'm just a, I'm just a farmer, like, I, I'm a preacher's daughter. I'm a farmer boy. I, I'm not some heroic adventure. How can I stand up to... You know, the the evil king's, uh, you know, knights of the... Knights of the burn stuff down. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, and so you have this, no, no, I, I can't do it. Or, or think that, like, the Bilbo Baggins, like, I'm just a hobbit. I'm, I'm not a thief. What, what do you want from me? I'm a dude. Or do that. <clears throat> then we have a meeting with the mentor. Uh, this is, you know, we'll reference Lord of the Rings again. This is your your Gandalf coming. Or this is the, let's go to the farming village example. And this is the mayor of town or your dad or um, or even it could be, um, you know, a, a school friend. You know, maybe there's a, a one-room school, but you know him from school. Or it could even end up being a romantic interest. You meet with a mentor. The mentor says, no, you got this. Follow me in. Um, you know, if, if any of you have seen Gurren Lagann, uh, Kamina is a mentor in this case. Um, <clears throat> you have this inspirational force. No, we can do it. And so there's this little mini conflict that gets resolved. And then we cross the threshold, right? We leave the borders of our farming village in order to go on this scouting party to the one next door that was burnt down. Or this is the big step from the Shire to Bree, which is still kind of in Shire lands, but not really many of the dwarves have ever been to Bree. And it's a normal town by all accounts, but, you know, there's a lot of humans there. Or we're outside of uh, Farmer Maggot's field, or uh, suddenly this this ordinary world that we've, we're, we're crossing out of is left behind, is the greater one with all these unknowns lies before us. <clears throat> so we're going... On a journey, uh, literally and metaphorically, and I'm, I'm literally, not saying literally, just because it is literally a language thing in 2018, arguably 2017 and beyond. 
Uh, you know, it, it was part of my little side rant. It, it's sort of like saying like. Like it's like. All, all the like. All the like. <laughs> hey, thank you, Teak. Uh, welcome aboard. We're doing some storytelling. Uh, comment, lurk, do whatever you like, man. Or woman. Uh, you can uh, you can comment, share your own uh, observations, uh, your own storytelling um, techniques as we're going over the hero's journey, and then I'm going to give you another way that you can build a story. <clears throat> so now we're out of the ordinary world. Um, you know, we're these like level one, two, three adventures. You know, if you want to consider it like one to five in our in our uh, bell curve, our, our distribution. Uh, We've crossed the threshold, and now we're in this special world. Uh, this this could be a magical place, another dimension, or it's just it's life outside of everything you knew. If if we're talking like Western European fantasy, uh, the, there's a good chance. So heck, you know what? Let's not even use a farmer. You're a noble. You're a prince. You've grown up in the castle grounds, most likely. This special world could be nothing more than the docks, the slums. Um, the next kingdom over, uh, it could be something, it, it could be supernatural or it could be even normal, but it's just not what you expected. Suddenly, whoa, your eyes are open. Uh, w what's going on? Or, or there's greater danger out here. <clears throat> and we come into a series of tests, allies, and enemies. Um, so this is now... You're, you're taking, uh, we'll go back to our, our farm hand or our, you know, our, our preacher's daughter here. Uh, you've received the lessons that you've had, you know, in character development, this is like your background, right? We're now out of the background and you're actually getting your first level in a class. Um, this is where uh, you know as a farmer that um, moss grows on the north side of trees and for some reason, like, you get lost. Well, this farming skill comes in handy and now uh, you're able to use it to find your way. You're being tested. Um, this is the first use of your weapon in a formal sense, not just training or, you know, as the uh, as the, the preacher's daughter, um, this is your first time. Like, you've always said your prayers, right? Uh, and it's not that you were you didn't mean it before, but maybe now you're being tested and in, in your, your faith is your strength. And now it's actually manifesting as a spell, as... Uh, minor miracles or something along those lines. And along the way, you make allies. Think back to Lord of the Rings. Who did they meet in Bree uh, that ended up becoming an ally? Um, or even who did who did Bilbo meet in the Shire that became an ally? You know, it's this gradual expansion. Uh, and then there's enemies, right? We have ring wraiths. So we'll use something popular there. Uh, we have, uh, if, you know, think about... Um, Think about Game of Thrones. You know, it starts out in kind of a limited sense, and now we've, we've grown and grown and grown. There are allies and enemies, and sometimes, you know, there's reversals of fortune. Uh, sporty. This special world can be yours if the price is right! <laughs> uh, just don't overbid. Uh, so, this is a period of growth, right? This is maybe... This is... Uh, if we're saying Act 1, this ordinary world is maybe levels 1 to 3... If we're talking D and D uh, fifth edition sense, right? Because uh, the latest you get your your first steps in being an archetype of some kind is level three. Some of you get it at one or two, but I don't know. Let's let's even call it five, right? Um, so you, you you've done all this, yeah. You swung a sword as a soldier. Congratulations, you're level one fighter or whatever, paladin or whatever, or even a ranger. And so now we're we're entering into this mid range. Then we come to the uh, the approach of the the innermost cave. This is uh, you've addressed the enemies, like in this case, the Mad King's army in the field. Maybe you've infiltrated. Uh, you're you're not you're not a one man army, but you're also maybe a band of ten people or something, or you know five people. And you're saying ten because you really like your horses and gave them names. So you have ten people, you know, in your force. <clears throat> and so now we have an approach to maybe not the the BBEG, the big bad evil guy, uh, but a force of some kind, or it's the first in-person appearance of the villain who will, you know, come back later after something along those lines. Um, so we have this approach. Uh, we have, we've left the ordinary world. Our confidence is raised. We've gone through some tests. And now, after testing out our skills, they're going to be put to a specified, uh, a specified use. 
in this gauntlet to reach this sub boss or whatever you want to call it. Then an ordeal occurs. Uh, this is a great conflict of some kind. This is um, uh, you emerge from the tests victorious, only to learn that um, only to learn that. Um, why am I why am I derping on his name? Tom Riddle is the snake dude. Wow, uh, shameful, shameful uh, on me for to forget that. Uh, Lord uh, Voldemort, derp 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 derp. Mm. Got to gotta laser that in there. <clears throat> uh, only to find out, right? So, like, uh, Harry's like, yeah, I graduated freshman year of high school. I'm ready to take on the world. And Voldemort just goes, nope. I'm, you know, 100 billion million years old and I'm super powerful. So you have this ordeal. There could be a, tra a tragedy somewhere involved. Or this is times where now we move on and there's a reward, which is, you know, like seizing the sword, right? It's, uh, it, you're the one true king. Or you get um, a MacGuffin. Which is a, a term that's the, you know, like the one true ring, the, the sword of the king, the, um, it's a, a device that has exceptional power of some kind, um, that uh, it's a, a title or a magic spell or an object, uh, that, you know, it's this MacGuffin, that's a reward for overcoming the trial. You know, even if it ended in defeat, maybe um, uh, you're able to, to steal something, right? Let's say you go a rogue, you're able to steal something off the boss or the sub boss or whatever this ordeal was, or you learned a valuable, a really valuable clue or lesson. And so now, now we're past level 10, right? Uh, cause that's kind of the middle of special world. Now we're on our, our path, um, to, uh, you know, to the end. And uh, towards the end, this is when we can have uh, a big conflict with the boss again um, you know, some mods will have a boss that kind of, uh, that appears back and then we have a, um, th there, there could be a sense of loss. We're getting into the 15 to 20 now in act three, and that's broken up in this case into three different parts. We have the road back resurrection and to return with the elixir, um, which is kind of like the cure all for what was causing the calamity in the original, in the original setting. So. Uh, we, we've gone through this, we've refined ourselves, honed ourselves, we have confidence, we've faced strife, we've gone through this uh, this whole thing, and uh, now there's this road back. It doesn't mean that you're going back to your home village at the end of the book or the campaign or something, not yet anyway. That could be the, we know what we're fighting for, we have the ability to fight for it, and so now we are on this home stretch that will eventually lead us back, but we need to push into the evil king's uh, castle go through the dungeons and go through his guards or whatever is there. And um, the resurrection is something that is that kind of last moment break or defeat or that's you're, you're the main character. So you have what's called plot armor, <laughs> um, though, not all the time, especially in a D&D campaign. But let, let's say in a book setting. Right. Um, and you lose your faithful companion, your friend, someone who's made it this far with you. And uh, he or she doesn't make it. We have the, the farming. Uh, we we have the farmer's son and the the preacher's daughter, and so maybe the two have have gotten this far together. And the uh, the farmer's son sacrifices himself, or um, you know the the preacher's daughter does something similar. Like, like she's struck down in this moment of we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it together. And then uh, blarg, and you know there's there's this tragedy. And so then, you know, at that point in time, if you sprinkled in some words of wisdom or some, you know, some foreshadowing or prophecy beforehand, you know, the, the memories or the words or a ghost of the person can come back. And this then, it shatters your character or it shatters your storyline that you're, you have a party of adventures going through. And then this event happens and it's sad, but it steals their resolve. We're going to get this done. Um, and you... You then uh, fight the enemy, and you're motivated, right? Ah, oh, you uh, you killed, uh, you killed my best friend, or you know someone who we've woven maybe a romantic interest uh, in, or a you know they were so close to achieving um, a, a knighthood title or something along those lines. So they fight, they they win, hopefully, although tragedies occur, and then they get to return uh, back to the ordinary world, which is now forever changed though they have the elixir 
in so much that by bringing down this evil uh, tyrant king, uh, the farming villages aren't being attacked anymore uh, for their, you know, like, and having their their grain stolen uh, to be brought back to the kingdom so you can wage messy wars. Uh, and so then at the end of your story, you present the starting area, but you say how it's been changed. Maybe a couple buildings had burned down. Maybe the population, you know, half of it fled. And so those that remained are still, they still carry the culture, but uh, the village uh, that you that you return to is now maybe, it's kind of haunted feeling or empty or... Um, as what happened in uh, the Lord of the Rings, uh, when they returned back to the Shire, and this this wasn't in the movies, unless I missed something on an extended cut, the Shire was fortified. People were carrying around weapons. Uh, they had barricades in the roads and were acting all you know kind of clenched up. And given the beginning of the story, where it's just this you know breezy eternal summer, rolling hills, everything is wonderful. Uh, it is the you know the. Uh, for any of you who play Magic the Gathering, it was the Lorwyn before the Shadow Moor came, kind of a thing. Well, now they return back to the same old Shire, and everyone is armed, and there's like these barricades in the road, and and you just think, oh my gosh, th this is my home, but it's it's changed, it's despoiled, or something happened, and you won, you beat the bad guy, the world is safe, but where you came from now is is changed, just as you are, as an individual or as a party. And that then the cycle can continue, right? Because you come home a hero, uh, you end up uh, having a pile of kids or something along those lines or adopting, and then something else happens because the world continues to turn. There's always going to be another threat somewhere and there's always going to be another solution. And then it becomes the journey, takes it up once more. You know, son of hero or whatever. Bubonic uh, Magic Kingdom for Sale Soul. The people from Perv are not perverts, because you sure don't call six foot six li lizard men with six inch claws, fangs, and extreme magic skills that. <laughs> um, so hopefully this uh, this is one image, this is one way that you can envision the hero's journey or the heroic cycle. Uh, there's a couple others, and I'll go through them in, in future broadcasts with you as well. Um, here is another way that, uh, especially as a DM, if you want to write a campaign that you can prepare for what can happen. Because there's a big difference between writing a novel and writing a D&D campaign. If you're writing a novel or uh, a short story, something like that, you have total control. You control what everyone says and does, and you control the, the losses and the wins and you know the whims, um, not just wins. So it's easy for you to be as subtle or direct as you want in order to have the characters go where you want and no one's saying, choo-choo, you're railroading me, DM. Uh, so in this case, uh, you're writing a, a path, a direct path for the story to flow. As a DM, I have found that it works best if you provide um, a sandbox for people to play in or if not like a monorail or like train tracks that you provide a, um, a four lane highway so that lanes can be shifted. You're still going in the, in the general direction that you want to travel, but there's rest stops along the way, or you can, you know, take an exit, refresh and come back onto the highway and continue. And you're, you're giving these boundaries, right? So there's like the ditch in between. And if you're on like the Ohio turnpike, I don't know if any of you have been on, on that, or it's not just the Ohio, because it, it goes uh, west-east. Um, but, you know, there's the concrete barriers or whatever, so there's ultimate boundaries, but you have freedom to bounce between it while making forward progress. Um, and what a lot of beginning uh, DMs and story writers say is, oh, I have these awesome characters in mind, and I have this, uh, you know, I have this, like, shire, this village, or even this city that people are starting out as, uh, and, and all these details come to mind, grand spires, or, you know, uh, waving golden fields of grain, or whatever, whatever it is. And, uh, and, and so you have this wonderful, you have this wonderful start full of detail and you say, okay, this is where it's going to start. And then oftentimes in everyone's mileage may differ, you know, check your, your dealer for details. And then we think, oh yeah, yeah. And then, uh, we'll, we'll fill in because there's going to be a, uh, 
a villain of some kind. Uh, you know, you have this cool, big, bad, evil guy, but maybe he's not really evil, but we got to show that. Um, and and you, you develop this, and he lives over in, like, the haunted house or the haunted castle, something along those lines. And... Um, and, and you say, okay, I'm going to hold that off to the side because I know how it's going to end. Uh, it's going to be this big fight. It's going to be on a, a crumbling balcony over, you know, um, a moat filled with, uh, like, poisonous lava with alligators in it. Because, you know, neither of those are just are, are uh, a threat enough. It is poisonous lava with alligators that you're fighting over top with the big bad evil guy, the BBEG. And you have this great climactic. Oh, there's lightning in the background, and uh, and and then there's this victory, and everyone's gonna cheer. And then you might even think, eh, you know, there's some kind of a like a an epilogue to it. And uh, and to that extent too, you might even make a few mental notes, like, okay, we're gonna have a um, um like a either a, a pre if not a preface, then a prologue. Like, okay, yeah, yeah, here's the setting, I'm going to set it up, and then I'm going to introduce the character in Chapter 1, or however you want to do it. Sounds like Final Fantasy. <laughs> well, a lot, of the, a lot of the storytelling is going to be the same thing, but different. You're just going to find different details uh, passed along, uh, Bubonic 1. And now we have the beginning of Act 1, and we have the end of Act 3, or arguably the end of Act 2, or whatever, the middle of Act 3, before the return home. Now, how do we fill 15 levels of content? <laughs> or how do we fill... Uh, we have our first chapter written, so that's, what, like, what, 15 pages? Then we have another 15 pages for the last. That's 30. Congratulations. We need to pound out a 350-page a novel. Well, we have 30 pages of that taken care of. So now we have to make 320 more pages of something happening to get us from there to there. And that's where we can often get bogged down as storytellers. And you say, oh, no, there's all these details. Well, I described these mountains. Well, maybe I should do something with the mountains. Or um, i got to throw in a character somewhere uh, as support or a rival. And, and, oh, my gosh, this is getting out of control because now I have to come up with names for all the cities. And I have to draw maps. And, oh, my gosh. what I, I, And you had this great idea, and you become demoralized. You, you wonder, what? well, now my story can't come to life. That's not true at all. Look at it this way. We have a beginning and an end. And we'll even take the, the villain out. The villain will be a part of it. But we just put that in parentheses because it's something to consider. So something is going to have to happen at the midpoint in order to uh, go from the start as being this uh, bright-eyed, um, you know, th these bright-eyed youths uh, full of vim and vigor. Uh, they're innocent to the world uh, before them, you know, becoming uh, what Firefly calls big damn heroes. Uh, Sam Weiss's daughter was a hero in her own right. If, uh, if any of you haven't read, uh, read the Lord of the Rings books, um, or even some of the, the supplemental stuff too, uh, like the, the, uh, Children of Huron, uh, I would recommend it. It's, uh, it's really cool. Uh, Bob has asked, what character are we going to write a story about? Uh, this could be... This could be any of our characters. If you all have a favorite one, uh, we can develop it. I was just going for a generic storytelling approach, but if you want to throw in a character, sure, or two, we can we can do that as well. Uh, so we say the midpoint is something like uh, we've we've determined now we want this to be a story about um, war. Uh, Bobby just likes the one that we just made. Uh, we can um, yeah we could probably. We'll do this, right? Because we saw the character up here. Drus Birog here. Um, uh, so Drus Pier, uh, and heck, we could even be making a story based on, you know, we have this evil character, but maybe Drus wins, or it's written that he's doing these evil, selfish things. He's not afraid to kill people in order to get what he wants, but he's considering the people he's killing to be bad. Uh, so, you know, you have this, this gnome raised by goblins, and he wants to bring down this city that uh, has their... It's a big developed city, but all of their uh, their sewage is uh, pouring into the river or is uh, is leaching out something, or there's such an industry there that uh, they're 
you know, they're, they're strip mining uh, the soil and the sand for iron uh, or, you know, silicone for glass, that kind of a thing. Uh, Memory Lapse says, one of the best things to do is to write down notes when you first uh, spawning the idea, then sort it out which note to detail. Yeah, you can always go back to your notes. Uh, I-90, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm talking about 80 and 90 uh, as they kind of come together or apart. And, uh... Yep, good old, or as I call it, the you know, well, because uh, I'm in Ohio, it's the Ohio Turnpike to me, but yeah, that's uh, I-90 or 80. Uh, so we have a story about war. At the start, things are going to be peaceful. And at the end, they're going to be, you know, there's this great conflict. Like, you, the end isn't a point. It's like, it, it's going to end in this great conflict. You have, uh, like, the Battle of Five Armies or something, right? You, we have hundreds of thousands of people clashing, and, and it's this, this great big thing. Oh, cool, Bobicus. Thanks for the link. Myths everyone believes about druids. <laughs> uh, I haven't uh, heard of that one before, but I'll be happy to check it out. So at some point in time, uh, our hero or anti-hero or whatever uh, is going to then need to uh, be put, uh, like, turn towards the BBEG. Um, so instead of worrying about the peaceful world that was around him or her, uh, that that attention is going to have to shift, and so are the abilities and everything else. And say, okay, so uh, we're we're making a bookmark here. We have a midway point. It's easy to think. Here's our start. Here's our middle. And what is in between? What is our what is our average spot? And so we may not know the details of this place yet, but we know that we need to create an environment as such. And then you say, um, oh, it's a take on chaotic druids and how they view the world. I, I'm, I love that alternative thinking, uh, Bobakis, so thank you. And it's apparently bubonic one agrees. So now we say, okay, we, we have these points, and now we go and how do we get from our peaceful starting town to the first appearance of the BBEG? Uh, something has to happen in between. So maybe there's a a run-in with the BBEG instead of being turds, uh, turned like towards the final path of, of conflict. There we go. And now on the other side of this, we can say, now that we've jumped ahead to this middle point and there's this turn towards, and then we get to the great battle, what has to happen in between coming to the, the path of the final battle and having the final battle? Usually something like that is some kind of a uh, great alliance, um, force, or even a, a MacGuffin that they acquire at some point in time. You know, this is the... If you don't strike the, the troll king down with a flaming or acidic weapon, he will only regenerate and come back stronger and meaner. Bef uh, and so then this is the midpoint is acquiring the item or the knowledge or something along those lines that you need to bring down this imaginary troll king. And you say, oh, okay, I like where this is going. I, I, I can see this now. Um, so now how do we get from the start of our story to the run-in with the BBEG? Well, usually the BBEG has some kind of minions or an influence. And so now this is first contact with evil influence. You don't need to worry about the details. They'll come to you. This is this is just a point on your story on uh, on your plot line. That's what we're doing. We've made a plot line of two points, and then we made a midpoint, and now we're making other points along the way. Uh, Memory says, or maybe a run in with one of his or her minions or colleagues that gives a hint to the BBEG. Bobby says for the BBEG for Mister Birog, someone that represents the seduction of civilization. Uh, so yeah, that that would draw him. Uh, that would draw him out into civilization, uh, kind of a thing. And uh, and what we'll do, uh, what I'll do, Bobicus, is I'll talk a general storyline, a plot, and then we can go and we can uh, paint in some details using uh, using Birog. So keep it coming. Use use the chat as like sticky notes or something, um, and 
we will return back to that and we'll slather on the details after we come up to these uh, these plot points. Uh, okay, so now we have this great alliance uh, or force and the MacGuffin. Um, I'm going to take these out so they don't seem too confusing here. One, two, and then we had our... Or two. And then... You can do this in an outline fashion as well. What happens then between... Uh, re, uh, achieving this MacGuffin of influence or an item and this epic great conflict at the end. We have it. We have to get it there. And so up and up above, that would almost be that road back or that final push into enemy territory. And so now that we forged this alliance and we have all this stuff, this is the um, travel to enemy territory. And you say, okay, so we'll insert some travel stuff. That's a good opportunity for conflict along the line, uh, along the way. And so now, <laughs> um, we can say, what happens between waking up one morning as a, a preacher's daughter or as a, a farmer's son and getting into the first contact with evil influence? And we say, oh, you know, usually something like this. This is, um, you know... Routine business and something normal goes wrong. Uh, the baker finds that his uh, sacks of flour are gone. That's that doesn't indicate that uh, you know there's a cult living in the hills or anything. It could lead to that, but it's a normal occurrence. Oh well, maybe they were misplaced or maybe they were burgled, um, and and what could happen? And then we can come down here and say, what happens between first contact with the evil influence? So we imagine that we found the missing sacks of flour, but we found uh, that there is a, a cult or this um, division of soldiers sent out by this troll king to uh, start gathering supplies because there's going to be this, this big army advancement going on. And so now we need to run in to the BBEG after having contact, like basic contact. Um, and this is usually where something like uh, introduce a sub boss or the regional influences uh, post. That could be a, a fort, an encampment, something along those lines. Uh, they go and they actually find out that the cult's been operating out of the, uh, the basement of the village uh, church and that the church has actually fallen, something like that. And lo and behold, um, there is the BBEG or a powerful agent of his or hers and they meet. Uh, as a good example of this, uh, think about Resident Evil 4. If any of you have played it or watched a playthrough, uh, something like that might come to mind as well. Okay, so boom. Then we have our run-in with the BBEG. Now we got to come down here. What happens between the run-in with the BBEG and turning uh, towards the path of final conflict where we say, no, we have to take him out. We can't negotiate. We can't do something. Um, oh, hey, uh, everyone, you can welcome uh, Raichi, uh, the tabby. He's up here sniffing around and covering my face. I have, uh, I have quite the epic beard and mustache going on now, don't I? Hey, what's this? Reggie, what's this? What's this? Hmm? Oh, okay. I guess he just wants scritches. Uh, so we see the BBG. We don't really have a conflict, or if we do, you know, we're easily defeated, or we're even just passed off of, look, you're just a bunch of mud, uh, mud kickers. I don't have time for you. I have other things to do, and we go from there. Um, so from in between running with the BBEG and we turn towards the BBEG on the final path of conflict, uh, we have to, 
maybe um, spread word of the dangers present. Uh, so we could work with what we already know and what we already have. Uh, that could be even going back to our farming village. And uh, here, I'll kind of have to I'll have to speak over Raichi. That could be going back to our village and saying, oh, we we saw the, the Mad King himself. He actually came down from his, his cloistered throne, and he said all this stuff, and now you need to try and rally everyone. That is going to uh, turn us on to uh, the, the path before we can get great allies or even a great item. Uh, I guess enjoy that little bit of cat butt, because this is a cat stream now, everyone. <laughs> Tabaxi Rogue has failed his stealth check. Yeah, he was a little obvious, wasn't he? <laughs> um, we have to often learn of resources available. So this could be learning of a mystic spell. This could be learning of a magic item. Learning of, oh, there's uh, there's a, a group like a counter cult. Or um, if you travel to the next lands, they despise this king and we're waiting. They're just waiting for an opportunity to come in and help take him out because of the atrocities he's committed against them. Boom. So now, uh, through this knowledge, we have this great alliance uh, force or MacGuffin. Now we need to... How do we get from that point... To actually traveling to enemy territory, and this could uh, this could involve uh, conflict, negotiation, even insert something like a travelogue, uh, which describes the lands in great detail. Um, we then get to enemy territory to like I guess this is more like travel through enemy territory. We've reached the gates of Mordor, everyone. Now we got to get to Mount Doom and Sauron, etc. So, this is also another time where we could use conflict, uh, like raids, or this is these are these can be uh, tests of skill or will or endurance, uh, a test of everything that you've learned up to this point in order to make this push up to the final climactic end of your campaign, the book you want to write, the mod, the short story, whatever. And then we come back, bada boom, there's our end. Ta-da! You can then can, uh, go through and you can write more halfway points between, you know, we have A, B, and C came between them, and then we have D between A and C, and then we have E between uh, C and B. And you can just go and make this as an outline. You can use uh, like the star method. You can just write it out, um, whatever works best for you. But now, without having to get bogged down in the details, you have comp you have comprised your own hero's journey, uh, with which isn't as broad as the one above because this is custom tailored to the original characters you had in mind and about which you feel very passionate. And, and you have these these lines that they want to say, and you know you want the cut on the cheek for the cool scar, or the big bad evil guy is actually this like excruciatingly like beautiful man who just has this presence about him, and you know no one can hate him even though he's a completely contemptible person. And you have this description of flawless porcelain skin or whatever. Uh, that passion is driving uh, your um, your outline for your story. Mount Doom is Johnny Quest, right? <laughs> uh, oh, and also, uh, bubonic one. Parents slain by evil humans. Goblin druid finds sickly BBG child. Yeah, uh, some of the most compelling villains aren't the obviously evil ones. It's super easy to hate someone who kicks cats and eats babies for breakfast. Um, that's a very blatant, direct villain. And they have a place in storytelling, don't get me wrong. But when you start making the compulsion about why he or she is acting in such a villainous, evil, selfish way, it makes them more understandable. And that puts your reader or your players in a somewhat uncomfortable position where they say, wow, this, once, once they learn, because you can put like the revelation of the past as one of those plot points, and your characters then sit back and say, we're going to get him because of everything he's done. But now I understand why. And then that causes them as a reader or a player uh, slash character to internalize what would I have done in that situation? 
was I one uh, one goblin raid away from being abducted, or you know, not uh, not necessarily was offered there. Um, what what if that was me? I could be this very person, and then you just go whoa. Then you you push through it, right? You're still you're still the big damn heroes. You're still the the ones who got to go in and kick down the door instead of maybe just outright slaughtering. You know, in the final conflict, maybe you offer the chance of mercy and redemption, um, because redemption is a very compelling force in storytelling. You know, it's something we all hope that is available to us, because we all make mistakes as individual human beings too. So we hope that maybe someone who is there, who is in a position of uh, a better position, financially, morally, legally, uh, will be there to not just rub it in our faces, but to offer us a hand up and, and help us. Um, and then it becomes up to the villain to say, you know, no, I'm too far gone or to, you know, grovel and then, you know, produce like a dagger out of the sleeve and, uh, and get that last strike in showing that no, uh, he is villainous to the core and nothing can change this. Or if you want to take the story in that direction, the villain, um, the villain gives him or herself up surrenders and, uh, you know, even knowing I may die. But I have uh, I have chosen not to act on something. Maybe even if it's in defiance of the characters. Like, I'm still in control. You may have captured me, but this is because this is what I have wanted. And now we're getting into the, we're getting into the weeds of details of, uh, of these characters. But now we can do that because we've made this outline, right? Uh, you, so you can't see. I, I should almost, like, lean over. We've made this outline, right? <laughs> uh, and... From that outline, you know, you have one, two, three in Roman numerals, and then you can go one, two, three in Arabic numerals, and then you can go like A, B, C in capital, A, B, C in lowercase, and then you get Roman, lowercase Roman numerals, depending on, you know, however you were taught to do outlines in school <laughs> or for your profession, because of course there's different ways of doing it everywhere. Uh, and now you feel that the, you, you, we've made a skeleton. We're, we're kind of necromancers, or in this case, conjurers, right? We have the core element, and now we're adding to it, we're molding it. Uh, and I missed a, a paragraph uh, from Bobicus. Sorry about that, Bobicus. Heads of the city and the wizard's toe has many roguish adventures of increasing depravity, frequent run-ins with the guards. The wizard and the city begin to teach him how to behave, which works for a while, but he rebels and flees to the forest, returns to the goblins and finds their squabbles for minor power petty in the face of the city. Okay. Um... So here, uh, the, I, I'm going to keep this as a basic structure for uh, for us to reference as points. But uh, we can use what Bobicus is presenting. And any of you uh, other commenters, lurkers, anyone in this channel, if you want to add or say, "Oh, you know what? Uh, uh, if you you know what, Matt or Bobicus or you know anyone else who's uh, um, you know or, or like Bubonic One or anyone else." Uh, I like that, but what if we did this instead? This is this is mutual storytelling. You know, no one here, including me as the host, has an exclusive monopoly on what is to be. Uh, I, I'm broadcasting this publicly because it's an open discussion. I want the best story that we can create at any given point in time with everyone who's here. That or if you just like sitting back and listening, uh, you know, to ambient music and narration or whatever, you can do that too. I am presenting graphical things, but that doesn't mean you can't just uh, go back or... I can't do some Dungeons & Dragons ASMR. <laughs> uh, uh, Bobicus continues, leads them on raids against villages. It goes poorly and he feels frustrated and powerless. He runs into the wizard again, defending the village from his attacks and begging him to change his ways. His ways. Words, ways, ways. This infuriates him more than anything. Let's do the old control enter. Um, so we have our character data over here. These are... Th this is the snapshot of who he currently is as we've manifested him. As Bobicus and some of the others are doing is we're going to go back in time a little bit. We know that we have a gnome born to gnome parents. Parents die somehow. We can like we'll we'll fill in. 
child adopted by Gabos. Uh, let's see, as was suggested here, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he raised by them becomes acolyte of Goblin Druid. So now we're incorporating our background. Our background is kind of what we did as a, a level zero commoner. Like, what it, it's before you started adventuring. So this is like level zero uh, Drusp. Drusp Bilrog. Uh, apprentice... Uh, acolyte, oh, acolyte to a shaman. Okay, so maybe, maybe in that case, uh, as uh, Bobicus I think is putting out there, the shaman might be kind of like the the tempest or the nature domain cleric for the more direct religious experience. So it's an acolyte to that, but there is an apprentice to a druid, and the druid could be um, another type of extension of this faith of some kind. Becomes acolyte of go goblin, shaman. You know, maybe. Nature, Cleric, or Tempest. Apprentice to Druid in the Warrens who serves the Head Shaman. Just filling in little details, too. Um, Then, uh, and, and this is a way now we're, we're subtly, uh, as Bobicus is saying, we're subtly introducing uh, cultural aspects while keeping the focus of the narrative on this character. Kills his druid master for being weak, as is the goblin custom. From there, uh, he decides to... Wander in the woods. Now, a question that we can go back and ask is, um, is this uh, maybe seeking to be stronger? Or maybe while he thought his master was weak, the other goblins of the tribe really liked that uh, druid. And so the goblins banished him. Uh, so while he did the right thing in goblin society, they banished him for it. And that could plant a seed of resentment inside of him to help get him on this more aggressive tone. Wander in the woods, seeking to be stronger, uh, or maybe was banished. Uh, wanders in the woods, discovers an adventuring wizard who befriends him. In this case, so, th so this would almost be, if we're filling in these character details uh, from what Bobicus is offering, this is almost like a second adoption. Right? He lost his parents before he knew them, and then he lost his adoptive parents because they shunned him or because he felt compelled to leave in some manner, whether it was self-imposed or uh, imposed externally. So, like, exposed? <laughs> he was exposed to the woods. <laughs> Second adoption by wandering wizard in the woods. You know, so this is... Uh, thematic, you know, uh, kind of emotional, and it's providing compelling reasons to this character's backstory. Um, heads to the city and the wizard's toe has many roguish adventures of increasing depravity. That's true. Um, wizards, uh, you, you could even argue that, uh, let's say it was a neutral good wizard or whatever. Wizards operate on a different mentality than others because they, they often are smarter, they know more things, so they can piece together information in different ways, they have access to all of these spells that can help them, and so you get this kind of social and mental separation that uh, just has them being different people, because they, they, they don't have to express themselves conceitedly that they're above people, but when you're rolling up a character that by default is smarter than... Uh, you know, like 50% of the normal population and will only get smarter uh, from there, that has an effect on your personality or that has an effect on the way that you think and interact with the world and maybe even your morals. Yeah, you're not going to eat babies and kick kittens, um, but you'll think about things in a different fashion. Uh, so, anyway, I'm sorry, that little that little aside aside. Um, taken 
into the city and exposed to humanoid cultures and different thinking by the wizard. Uh, so we, he's uh, he's now like a couple, like a level, I don't know, two druid or three or something. There is an intelligence, right? We have to explain in the story why we also have an intelligent and not just wise druid. Well, here we go. We have an apprentice. Uh, he's, an, he's now a, an apprentice to a wizard, and he's learning all this stuff. Um, and I, I, I see some of you while I'm narrating are, are chatting. I will get down to it real quick. I want to make sure that I'm going over what's being submitted and trying to weave it into what we have going. Um, let's see. Frequent run-ins with the guards. The wizard in the city begin to teach him how to behave, which works for a while, but he rebels and flees to the forest. So this is going to be, um, tries to adapt and conflicts occur, leading to discouragement. There we go. The computer tells me I know how to spell now. Um, at some point he will rebel and flee back into the forest. Uh, and this could be, uh, maybe he tried to kill the wizard and failed. Because maybe he saw the wizard as being the off one. Uh, maybe the wizard is trying to do these things and he just says, no, they're not working. They're, you know, they're not working for me. They're not working. You know, you're, you're failing. Not all wizards are like gray beards with pointy hats. It could be like a young charismatic wizard for all we know. Um, but this, this goblin raised gnome is now seeing that not everything, like after this period of, of joy, of learning and of trying to take everything that's there, you know, then his, his nature sets in and it starts uh, perverting the experience and making it so that he's now in conflict because nothing is as what he thought it was. Um, so we can fill in a detail about what happens there. Um, he feels frustrated and powerless. He runs... Uh, okay, so let's go. Rebels and flees in the forest. Returns to the goblins. Finds their squabbles for minor... Uh, okay. So we have him on this, on this journey back. Journeys back to goblins. Confident he can prove his strength, which will keep them from killing him, right? If he's uh, if he's been banished or something and is now returning. Uh, finds their culture also, uh, also petty and full of power struggles. Uh, same as the deprived humanoids. This is meaning that he's carving out a niche for himself. He is now thinking that he is exempt from these different societies, goblinoid and humanoid alike, maybe above law or above, you know, the, the practices of magic. And, um, and so this might be him further embracing nature, right? Nature grows everywhere. It grows in its own path. You got weeds uh, sprouting up out of uh, clogged gutters and between cobbles. You have uh, mighty forests rising up or tearing down mountains. And so maybe he is getting this appreciation for nature and that nature will always exist regardless of the structures of men or goblinoids that are around him. Um... Heads to the city in the wizard's toe. Uh, hang on, this is after... Uh, okay, no, no, no. So that, that was the petty squabbles. Leads them on raids against the villages. Okay, or or uh, I might have gotten ahead of myself. It goes poorly and he feels frustrated. Well, okay, so that was the backup reason. Runs into the wizard again, defending the village from his attacks and begging him to change his ways. Ooh, nice. So we get that, that conflict with the mentor that was in the hero's journey. Um... Deprived humanoids. Uh, so uh, I got a little ahead of myself, so we'll say leads Gabos to attack city uh, to prove his strength. Wizard mentor defends it and pleads for him to change. We'll say stop, so I don't have to go on a second line without changing my margins. <laughs> uh, some uh, author and storyteller shortcuts, right? Um, this infuriates him more. The wi uh, so the wizard is the BBG, essentially. Um, okay, so in this case, uh, we'll make a note. You know, is the 
are we going to have the wizard defeated here or set up for later BBEG, uh, which, you know, in this case would almost be like, uh, I don't know if it's a commonly used word, like an UGG, a UGG, like the ultimate good guy. Uh, if not, we'll just use that as an abbreviation here. Because if this is coming from the point of view of an evil character, our big bad evil guy is going to be the good guy, right? There we go. Um, ultimately, then you want those uh, you want those wizards boots because then you'll be getting some UGG boots, and uh, I think those are expensive, right? <laughs> um, uh, empathize with your enemy, bubonic one. Yes, I just sort of thought Druid needs to spend some time with nature. Um, yeah, memory lapse, uh, making notes so they can be referenced later. I'm thinking the wizard is neutral evil as well, but loves civilization for the levers of power that it offers. So that's a good twist. Uh, because while good and good can, you know, have conflict, evil and evil will almost always have conflict because it's a contest of egos, whims, or even just these evil direct uh, 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 dire uh, dictates, if you're going the lawful route. Um, so we'll even add here... Uh, wizard is evil question mark likes civilization for what it can give him so yeah the this uh this gnome goblin gnome gnomish goblin uh was receiving uh these odd life lessons from a possibly evil wizard and just uh you know still couldn't uh couldn't jive with him uh, the Druids hate civilization because grabbing the levers of power also requires submitting to others. That's true. Or even civilization. Look, if you want to build buildings, you got to cut down tree. I mean, we're going for a simplistic approach, right? you got to cut down trees, burn firewood, uh, quarry up stone that was being perfectly happy laying in the mountain or laying in the ground. Um, sort of dark mirrors each other. Uh, then memory lapses, uh, potter mirrored riddle, two sides of the same coin idea. Yep, that that's, uh, that's good too. Uh... Bubonic one, not treated well at first, but the druid takes under wing. Uh, so here then is a, a basic setup. And if we were to extrapolate this, you know, the, the direction, uh, because now he's kind of mid-level, right? We've had the, w while we've had the run-in, it turns out the mentor from earlier in the hero's journey up here, meeting with the mentor, turns into that first contact with the BBEG. And so now uh, realizing, like having been, uh, rebuffed by civ uh, civilization and his former mentor, um, the druid retreats to find power, spells, um, knowledge, items, allies, etc., in order to come back and reconquer uh, this this place from this wizard and just from these humanoids in general who are, you know, these scheming degenerates or they uh, they just ain't right. <laughs> um, oh yeah, Bobacus, uh, can we see the hero's journey again? Here we go. Three acts, ordinary world, call to adventure, refusal, meeting with the mentor. Then we cross the threshold as act one to act two as the transition. Then we have a period of ambiguous time where there's tests, allies, and enemies. And then the approach to the innermost cave. And then in the middle, we have an ordeal of some variety. It could be moral, it could be physical, a mix of both. Uh, then there's, it, they leave it a little open here, there's this reward or seizing the sword. So there could be a journey, there could be how do you uh, uh, learn of the sword, how do you seize it, and what do you do immediately afterwards? Um, you know, what if it changes you? And then you say, now with the sword, you know, here's the road back, or the or like the, the road home, or the, the last stretch. Uh, we have a resurrection, that could also be like a redemption, that could be... Uh, a second wind, physically, emotionally, religiously, something along those lines. And then um, the enemy is defeated and we return back home with the elixir or this, you know, this cure-all so that the world, as we once knew it, will hopefully be able to return back to as we once knew it. But of course, you know, between us, we know that can never be the case. Um, so yeah, uh, starts a campaign of sabotage and eco-terrorism. Yeah, so th that's like the, the methodology. Um, so this could be his uh, eco-terrorism. Uh, this could, uh, he could find allies in, uh, he's not super animal friendly or, or animalistic, but that doesn't mean we still can't, you know, keep it as a background thing. So maybe he finds, uh, 
or if not, um, you know, I'll tell you this. Um, he is a druid. Yeah, he has animals. If we're talking fae, and I just don't mean elves. Elves are a, a derivative fae. They're like a mortal, physical fae. But if we start talking about things like pixies and dryads and, um, oh, geez, uh, brownies and... <sighs> Why is this escaping me? Well, there's a lot of fae creatures or uh, a normal creature that has a fae, a fae influence. The fae can be super duper nasty. I mean, you walk into a dryad grove and you could just walk past a tree and for simply being a non fey or carrying metal on you or have, uh, I don't know, they smell meat on your breath or something, a, a dryad will just jump out of a tree and cut your throat. Like, the fey aren't these beautiful, wonderful creatures of benevolence. They have their own society and their own ideals and they can be vicious little things. You can replace things with another word of choice if you want. Uh, how would his decisions force others' hands? Uh, yeah, that's true. Because uh, the wizard would have to say, oh, you know what? We, we got to do this. Or, or even we have our evil character schemes that are interfering with what the wizard had, has planned. So maybe the wizard actually wanted to take over the city somehow, right? Almost like a, a worm tongue if we're going to go back to Lord of the Rings. Um... But now the city's resources have to be used towards defending against these uh, these eco-terrorist attacks from this other evil entity. And so the treasuries are draining, human resources are draining, he has to put his own magics from uh, against like weaving spells of charm against the populace. Uh, he has to defend the city if he ever wants to hope to hold on to it. And so here we have this, this gnome that's completely interfering with his plans, where once he thought, hey, I have a minion, or I have you know my second banana, I have this person who's going to sit on the throne at my right hand with me, because he gets it before things exploded. Uh, you could find an ally that secretly would be fighting for the same side of the same coin and eventually challenges for him uh, as memory lapse offers. So you mean like a double agent, like the the wizard, uh, the wizard finds someone and this could be compelling storytelling too. Um, find someone and maybe sends them out as an ally, but it's really a double agent and that could cause, you know, a bit of romance and then heartbreak and, and determination. You know, how tragic, <laughs> how tragic do we want to make this villain? <laughs> and by villain, I mean hero, but he's still a villain. Um, and so now now we have really compelling storytelling. So anyway, uh, eco-terrorism, forays into the city, uh, sewers, etc. to wage war against the wizard and uh, civilization. Um... So this would lead to uh, kind of a, and uh, he finds various allies and it becomes almost a battle of attrition between the forces, frustrating both and for different reasons. Uh, we can say that the wizard plants an ally slash, you know, love interest, question mark, to help and even allows the gnome, the home, the gnome progress to be made uh, as a lure, right? So now the gnome makes a, a, a foray into the city. He's pushing. He's never got this far before. Now encouraged by this spy. Uh, maybe he makes, um, you know, he should be smarter than this, right? Look at, look at the intelligence score. That's a 16. He should be smarter. He pushes. But maybe that animalistic instinct. He's a druid. You know, he's taking these shapes. He's like, no, my prey is weak. I uh, and, and this is the goblin's teachings. My prey is weak. I have to go in for the kill. Meanwhile, the, the wizard is sitting back going, ah, good, good. You're falling into my trap. And so, and so he does. Um, falls into trap slash betrayal when this love interest or this, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, if, if it's a love interest or it's, you know, some sort of a, a friend, someone who thought he was going to be beside him, maybe even someone from his, the goblin town who... Um, you know what, maybe he just took money or other things from the wizard. Because uh, the goblins, either, you know, 
they don't care for him maybe originally, or he just found an opportunistic one. But now you have this ally who backstabs, especially not only is not only has our hero slash villain fallen into a trap, but there's a backstab. And, you know, this person is, uh, you know, lower than a snake's feet. Yeah, I'll let you think about that for a second. Falls in the trap and betrayal. And this then leads to uh, some kind of uh, an escape or final battle after a cunning resolution. Uh, he journeys to the Feywild in search of power. Yeah, uh, that would be an excellent place to learn how to make poisons and plant bombs and other things like that, uh, Bobicus. Uh, so we can also put um, Feywild, question mark. That's a very supernatural place. And because it's supernatural. <laughs> Uh, that could be a fey idea, fighting for the same side. It would be nice if the wizard could represent the seduction of civilization. Um, yeah, we, we can, I mean, we'll, we, we can make a note here about that. That's not a problem. There we go. You know, oh, give up being, you know, the jungle boy or give up being, you know, this forest gnome. Um, I mean, because it is a forest gnome, but whatever. Um, you know, come live in the, the creature comforts, even though there's no creatures, right? Because it's a concrete jungle. Uh, live in the creature comforts, have these people serve you, do all this instead of having to eke out, scratch out an existence in the woods. You know, having to pick ticks off yourself or, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, evil versus evil wars will always be worse than good versus evil. Yes, because either side are willing to go to extremes or to have a battle of attrition where everyone is grinding against everyone else and it becomes this, you know, this, uh, this last stand of sorts. Uh, you know, everyone's willing to be sacrificed, everyone and everything, and it, it turns bad. Uh, I like somehow the wizard offers him power in exchange for submission. So like a last chance kind of a thing. I, I, I can see that, Bob. It's an artifact. Raging grants him power but corrupts his mind. Uh, it's left in one of the villages he attacks. Uh, final battle. Uh, actually, let's do this. Because the wizard, the wizard wants the city and its people more than killing this person. And this person might even still be able to be a powerful servant, because that's what the wizard wants anyway. Um, offers a chance at redemption in this moment. Gnome ponders, refuses, escapes. Only to um, stop and confront the wizard at an opportune moment. Uh, so maybe he escapes and the wizard's like, ah, whatever, he got away. Uh, maybe he's learned his lesson and the uh, wizard goes back to his chamber. Well, the gnome knows where the wizard's chamber is and through turning into a cat or a crow or, I don't know, something along those lines, flies there and is waiting for the wizard in his own private room in order to waylay him. Or he takes the shape of the wizard's familiar because he's, uh, because the wizard uh, or the gnome is familiar, the druid is familiar with the familiar. And so, you know, you have, you have the cat, right? The wizard's cat, we'll say, or toad or something. Wizard's like, oh, you know monologue, 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 it's really a shame, you know, ends up making a confession, even a heartfelt confession, like, I don't want to kill him, but all this happens, and so the 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 shape-shifted druid hears this, and then takes this moment to reflect on it, but realizes, no, I'm ending this now, and, you know, surprise, you know, right in the wizard's lap, and, you know, a bunch of thorns, or a fire or something, or whatever, uh, you know, whenever it comes out. So, I, I don't know, that, that seems kind of compelling, right? Gnome ponders refusing. Uh, 
uses druid powers to get upper hand on wizard familiar. Contemplates confession and then ends the wizard. How's that sounding to you all? You you all have put in a lot of input. I'm kind of a filter or I, I'm your secretary here trying to arrange everything. <laughs> does that seem uh does that seem like a, a cool uh you know that this is this is getting our, our druid up to level 10, and at this point we can say, well, technically, uh, you know, while while this is bringing in Act 1, 2, or 3, this is really just Act 1, 2, and 3, if he's level 10, of a two-part story. Of a, you know, and so the sequel will pick up the next campaign, the next module, whatever we're developing here. The next one will pick up back at, hey, the land has returned now to what he wants, because the maybe he actually punished the city, and the people fled, the, the wizard's gone. Um, maybe the goblins died in this war of attrition, or were driven off. And so now he has the land to himself. Um, time can pass. Look, he's a young gnome, right? He's 140 years old. A uh, hundred years can pass, and someone else comes along, or he moves along someplace else. And now we get the, what happens between levels 11 and 20 adventure. An artifact or agent. Okay, yeah. Faye is bad when mad. Yeah, because they're normally just they're tricksy and uh, they're they're tricksy and vicious when they're in a good mood. And when you get them in a bad, that's that's no bueno. What if tempting? Uh, what if tempting deal the wizard offers? Oh, oh, okay. Right. What if it is quote continue your war but attack where I tell you to, and you will have perpetual victory, and I will have control of my city. You will destroy many villages and farms and return them to the land only to submit to me and grant me power. That part is important, Bobicus, because for a villain against a villain like this, we have to reinforce, even if it sounds a little ham-fisted as a DM or as an author, we have to reinforce the intent of this villain. Otherwise, a villain is a villain is a villain. So he's always, it's part of his personality here, he always has to make sure that he is asserting himself, right? He is the alpha wizard. Um, you know, serve me, or, uh, you know, do you want to, uh, uh, do you want to serve in hell or kneel in heaven kind of a thing, uh, as the expression goes. Uh, falls in a trap of trail, offered a chance at redemption. Only must submit. Else he's the... You know he's the lieutenant of this of this um, this ruler, and so at, at no point in time are we ever really painting him, uh, the gnome, as a good guy. We might be able to you know feel alongside him as he's betrayed because we've all had uh, moments of sadness or betrayal, but it's good because we've never had a truly good guy. Yet we have a we have a character that's still relatable and we can have emotions for, while also juxtapositioning that against. A really evil <laughs> person. <laughs> uh, I will. Uh, I'll just copy and I'll copy and paste this here real quick. Uh, Bobacus just says, you know, because uh, dialogue is is detail, just kind of like uh, uh, it's dialogue, just kind of like. Uh, or that's even more detailed than saying, oh, you know, the copper hair flowed and sparkled in the sun, or, you know, the the gentle uh, burbling of the brook uh, put the, you know, the baby deer to sleep, or whatever like that. Well, girls and boys, boys and girls, uh, DMs, players, etc., I think we have, we've done a good job here. Not only did we go over some basic storytelling techniques, and there's others that exist. Uh, we'll cover them eventually. Uh, we've done that. We've then gone through... Uh, with with all of your all's help, you can, even if even if you're a lurker, uh, you're showing up as an active viewer in the channel, and other people are seeing that. Oh, hey, this D and D channel has X amount of people watching, and I I want to be there. I want to be a part of it. Or they'll consider it and maybe join us next time. And they'll they'll sit at our table. You know, we'll all break mental bread together. We'll all um, put our heads together, and we'll continue to grow, share stories, get into it, learn tips and uh, tricks and techniques. Uh, and so forth. 
Uh, memory says, always plant the seed or seeds of compelling storytelling. Fae can be very compelling in this setting, considering the things they can do. They can do a lot of the same things as a wizard. Uh, yeah, just kind of the same thing but different, or the same thing but in a limited fashion, right? Because dryads really... It's not that they can't uh, live outside of their tree or their dryad grove, but they're better at it. Um, uh, if we look at things like the Monster Manual, and, w and we're going to look at just pure mechanics for this, you often get... Mm, pardon me. Layer bonuses for your monsters if they're in a natural habitat. Okay, so I'm going to get this saved. Uh, let's go into a short rest. Uh, I'm going to get up, you know, stretch, uh, probably uh, eat some more salsa that I, I might regret a little bit here, get a, a swig of tea. Uh, you all do the same, you know, uh, visit, the, visit the potty if you have to, do what you got to do, and we'll be back in about 10 minutes.